Uh, and so we're going to be uh, talking about, obviously, the this Western Legislative Impacts on Traditional Medical Practices, which Helen uh, has put together uh, in the past and is going to reprise it and uh, present it, and I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, for those of you who aren't members, uh, we do have uh, uh, membership things that you can fill out over there, and you can become a member of the uh, Kauai Historic Society. We are separate from the Kauai Museum. A lot of people think we might be part of them, but we kind of interact with them, but we're really not part of the Kauai Museum. We're all you. So, uh, anyway, feel free to go over there and get some information, and if you're so inclined, uh, it would be a uh, pleasure to have you as part of the membership uh, of the Kauai Historical System. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Helen Paul Smith, our executive director, and she's going to give it. Okay, I shall. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, for those of you who have uh, not heard my talks before, I always like to explain the, um, the alphabet soup after my name. So the MLIS is a librarian and the CA is a certified archivist. And the main reason that, uh, the main difference is that libraries have published materials and archives have unpublished materials. So whereas a library will have um, a nice call number and subject heading, it's very easy to find things. But archives, we don't do that. We make you work. So, so we create finding aids, and we describe the collection. And an archivist should know her collection, or his collection. I don't mean to be gender biased. Um, the collection enough to know what it doesn't have. So if somebody's looking up material on leprosy, and um, their, your collection um, doesn't have anything, you, they should, you should say so, um, because often people think, oh, it's a medical collection, um, they must have something on Kalapapa, and not all of them do. I was at, at Queens, I was the first archivist at Queens, and we had nothing on um, the leprosy um, that you would, people assumed that we did. So this is why um, we, what, what we have, and you'll find it on our website, is we have finding aids, and you read the finding aid that tells you about the collection. And you'll see a container list, and that way you can say, oh yes, I'm interested in this particular um, file. It looks like it has information I'm interested in. So this is a compilation of, um, when I was still with the College of Pharmacy, the, one of the professors who taught history of pharmacy was very interest, interested in the opium laws that occurred in Hawaii. So um, I did that and some of the leprosy and I said, you know what's even more interesting is how they impacted traditional um, practitioners. And so we incorporated, I incorporated that together um, for this um, presentation. So I'll start off with the opium uh, I'm going to cover opium, a little bit of leprosy laws, and then how the um, legislature, um, the, the kingdom, through the, through the five governments of Hawaii, how they interacted and tried to legislate and control traditional practitioners. So um, in opium, you know, you always had these um, ads in the Polynesian and prepared opium, um, R. Cody and company, or 50 doses of elixir of opium and 10 pounds of gum opium for sale at Lanthrop, with, with Lanthrums. So um, Honolulu retail stores always sold it. They sold it as an elixir. Now remember, this is the era that you had doctor, so, fake doctor so-and-so's magic potion that was going to cure all and such. So that was always going on. So with the Chinese um, contract laborers, when they started coming in 1852, um, part of that problem that came along was um, higher uh, opium use. And so the, the retailers were happy to accommodate them. So they had, um, they added prepared opium. So what I think is interesting is um, Chief Justice William Lee, who came to Hawaii with Charles Reed Bishop, that we all have heard of, um, he was the one who strongly supported uh, the recruitment of the industrious Chinese um, to, and told the legislature to take action. And um, then he went, oh my gosh, what's with this opium problem? And so he started speaking out against it, and Kamehameha IV actually discussed it in his opening to, uh, speech to the legislature So in 1856. So by 56, it was considered a Chinese problem, not, not a 
kingdom problem, just the Chinese problem, okay? So um, this is their response. In, the, in 56, they started um, recognizing the need for legislation, and um, so they said, well, we're gonna protect the life and health of the Chinese population, and they were concerned about how it was impacting the obviously declining population of the Native Hawaiians. So that was something else that, um, uh, and of course, number one, right? It's all about production. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, they're not, they're not being as productive as we need them to be. So what they did in 56 is this is, one of the, this is the first legislation. The first legislation, um, I don't like to read things that you can read, so I'm just gonna leave that up there for you. But I do wanna tell you that um, Dr. McKibben is the first doctor who had a, a regular pharmacy in Honolulu. And one night, thieves got 40 pounds of, from, of opium from Dr. McKibben's pharmacy. So in 56, the law was um, passed to prohibit opium sales to Chinese laborers, mainly to protect their owner's investment. I just love that word. Um, <laughs> so the use of the drug not only renders the coolie worthless as a servant, but works the certain destruction of his life and health, claimed Chief Justice William Lee. So um, these were the, um, the the laws that were put on the books. And so you can see that sales to Chinese were um, forbidden, and then the fines were increased from 50 to $500. But for the five convictions of the fine that when it was $50, they were paid within three days. So it wasn't really a hardship that people were, were um, dealing with here. So what do you do? It's still continuing. So they decided, okay, what the heck, we're just gonna create a Chinese license. Okay, because we need money anyway. Um, so what this is, it acknowledged the control of opium smoking among the Chinese was not effective. So if it wasn't effective and compounded with the U.S. government's um, uh, minister, Reed, promoted forcing China to give full legislation of in incoming opium shipments. So these were treaties um, done in 1858 with the U.S. government after the Taiping Rebe um, Rebellion. So that impacted what was gonna to happen to us. So you got the US saying, even though we're still a kingdom, you got the US saying, no, 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 we want this to continue. We want this import to continue. So, um, so this is what they came up with. And what they did is that um, Hawaii was in dire need of income. We were going from whaling to sugar at this, at this era. So um, they decided that they would enact this and allow Chinese licenses. Isn't that a horrible term? Chinese licenses. But that's what it was specifically for. So um, it remained, and I highlighted here, so these are comparative tables of leading imports of the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands, and opium is here at $23,000. That's no small change back in the day. So what's higher? Um, you got dry goods, okay, gunpowder, look how little gunpowder is, 1,000. Um, so it just gives you some um, relativity to see the kind of income that opium was bringing in. So because of that, they decided, okay, this is getting to be um, just the Chinese, it, it, theoretically, but they realized that we can make more money off of this. Okay, so they had the Ka'ai license bill said, let's have a, um, a bidding uh, auction, an auction for, with the upset price of 16,000. At the same, very, um, very close to that was this prohibitory bill authorizing only the Board of Health to import and furnish opium. So the problem is that the license, this one, was already sold when the prohibitory bill took place. Gee, that kind of throws a kink in there. So Kalakaua vetoed the re reintroduction of the Ka'ai bill and continued the prohibitory act. And he then strengthened the prohibitory act and liberalized the medical licensing practices. So this called, caused a spate of appeals because we were like, wait, 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 we had the bill. We had the... Um, the license to do that. So you had all these 
um, to the appeals to the Supreme Court when criminal prosecutors, prosecutions started taking effect with the prohibitory bill. So you have this license, then people are being arrested because it's prohibited, and people are saying, well, this, is not, this is not right. So in 1880, the legislature enacted a short statute which provided for the first time that Chinese physicians were to be licensed to practice medicine, and they would have the same um, um, had to adhere to the same laws um, and restrictions as other licensed physicians. So what does that mean, Chinese physician? Okay, think about that. So what happened was that in 1886, they said, okay, we can't, we give up. And, and I'll give you some other insights that I think are hilarious, but smuggling could not be permit, prevented. We need the revenue, so let's do a license at 30,000, see how the price keeps going up for the license? It's really quite interesting. Um, and that you, you can sell to, you know, not Hawaiians, not Japanese, you gotta, you know, nobody else, these are the terms. And so Kalakaua and the cabinet responded um, for two public um, licenses. And this um, article in the Hawaiian Gazette says, to cap the climax, in the opium matter, the attorney general proceeded, uh, proceeds to acknowledge that the money was paid over the Chinese for the, after the reference made to the matter. Okay, let me show you what this is all about. This is fabulous. Um, I have to read this to you because it gets a little con convoluted and I dropped out of law school. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a good Chinese daughter. I didn't become an attorney. <laughs> okay. So, um, and Charles Reed Bishop warned them. He said that a single license without an auction would lead to corruption and scandal. So a Chinese sugar planter and merchant, Tong Ki, also known as Aki, persuaded by Junius um, Ka'ai, the registrar of conveyances, offered a gift of 75,000 Kalakawa in exchange for a successful bidding on one of the licenses. Kalakawa accepted 71,000 with the additional 4,000 to be paid after the license was given. When Kalakawa awarded the bid to Chun Lung, Aki sued Kalakawa and won. The king disclaimed any involvement, but as seen here, the attorney general had acknowledged the money was paid by Aki. Chun Lung's rights and privileges were sharply reduced. No legal right to appoint agents to sell the drug on the outer islands. Okay, so the situation was further clouded in April 87 when the Supreme Court in King versus Young Tang held that, albeit reluctantly, the mere possession was not a crime under the act. Unlicensed selling was still an offense, simple possession was not. Okay, so that's where that um, fell. Um, there, so someone made a lot of money, it wasn't poor Mr. Lung. Um, this gives you, in 1890, so you had stamps, right? Because back then, that's how you, um, you taxed things, you would buy the stamp and you affixed it on the bottle and that's what the opium was sold in. And um, so this, the stamps, uh, the receipts were over $10,000. So that was still a very good um, number. Um, of income. So a friend of mine, while I was doing this study, was working at the, researching the court records. Um, and he said, I know the court records, I'm looking at the highest number of arrests per category in the 1890s is fake for opium. So I thought that was interesting, is that they would arrest people and then find out it was for, they couldn't make it stick. So if these things are not working, what was the government going to do? They came up with this, the Opium Den Act. So the Opium Den Act was um, introduced by these three representatives um, to legalize opium. And um, especially, this is the part that I just think is hilarious. When it came out that members of the police, the Hawaiian League, and others were secretly involved in the profiteering from the opium trade. This is straight out of Kaikendal. Okay, um, so these were the licenses. 
that were um, given off so that you create a, a den. And these were the conditions for running the den. So this gives you an idea. So Lily Okalani was the queen at the, was in, on uh, the throne at the time, and she signed this on January 13th, 1893. Just prior, she accused Representative White of railroading this and the Louisiana lottery bill. I don't know how many of you know that she did sign a lottery bill during her last few days um, on the throne. Um, it's another reason, another way to try to raise um, revenue. And later blamed the new ministers for advising her to approve both bills, saying I had no option but to sign. Well, four days later, the, um, the Committee on Public Safety overthrew the government. And of course, the, um, they claimed the provisional government um, established, the, the Committee on Public Safety established the provisional government, and um, they, of course, had been longtime opponents, Thurston and Dole, had been longtime opponents of opium, so they said that's it. So on February 12, in 1893, the Council repealed the Ashford Act and um, reinstituted the pre-1886 prohibitory laws, but with more stringent penalties. So that's where we're at. So now we have the um, provisional government, the Republic of Hawaii, and then in 1900, um, you, Hawaii becomes annexed. Okay? So when we're annexed under the Organic Act, we are now subject to the 1880. 82, 1882 um, Chinese Exclusion Act that the US government had. So not only you can't have any more Chinese coming in. Um, so this, this act was um, suspended, this act suspended importation of more laborers. That's basically what it was. So it went for 10 years and the Geary Act extended it for another 10 years and it actually stayed on the books until World War II when we were allies with China against Japan. So it wasn't until 43 that um, it was um, repealed. So um, in 1901, Chief um, Justice um, Judd had reported to the legislature that the opium cases are confined almost exclusively to the Chinese. So we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so I thought, so there, it, it may henceforth disappear in whole or in part under the operation of certain provisions of the federal constitution. So he felt that we are now part of the U.S., they're not allowed to bring more Chinese in, the opium problem will disappear. Okay then. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk, uh, I'm sorry? Did you do this? <sighs> they, the, you still had open opium dens. You still had it going on. And just um, might you know prior to the Opium Den Act whether mm -hmm. smoking opium was done in dens because it was supposed to be restricted to doctors to give it? Or did you give it and say go home and smoke it? Or were there really dens but nobody was governing that? Before? Nobody was governing. I mean there's a lot. It's like the Chinatown plague. I mean the, the Chinatown fire, right? They're saying, but then you hear other sides of it that said, no, that was intentionally allowed to get out of hand because then I'll destroy the opium dens as well. So there's different stories that you hear from. I, I, I just look for the research and I do look for the documents. You know, I don't, somebody asked me after Randy's talk, they said, well, what do you think? I said, no, I'm an archivist in my I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not going to say what happened. I'm just going to give you the resources to say what happened. Okay. Uh, the Chinese had a predilection for that particular drug. I don't know Right, yeah, and that's why they were saying you can't sell it to Japanese and they're worried about the Hawaiian population and such, you know. Well, we know what that's like today. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And then, you know, even getting back to why opium was introduced to China in the first place is a whole other story, but we won't talk about the English. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, because I don't have English blood, so I can't say anything stink about that. Whereas I can say anything I want about the Chinese. Um, <laughs> um, I just wanted people to know, it was switching over to leprosy, and, you know, this talk is mostly about the legislation that addressed certain issues, 
you know, that's what this talk is about. It's not a history talk about, you know, the whole thing of opium problem or leprosy problem. I wanted to just focus on how did our legislators react to certain health issues. And so opium was considered a health issue. Leprosy, of course, is considered a health issue. And so that's what um, I wanted to focus on. And I just want people, I like people to see how our different governments reacted to um, one sector of um, our culture or what was going on in, in, our, in our islands. So um, the first documented case of leprosy was right here on this island. But what I thought was interesting is that a missionary report in 1823, remember they came in 1820, and a missionary report um, by Charles Stewart may have seen the first leprosy victims on, um, in Hawaii when he wrote, the inhabitants generally are subject to many disorders of the skin. The majority are more or less disfigured by eruptions and sores, and many as, are as unsightly as lepers. Um, I'm trying to remember where Stewart made this observation, um, I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it was on the big island, so I have to double check on that one. But in, um, so you have all these things, and you know, see how um, proactive our ali'i were. You know, um, when um, Kina'u was the Kuhina Nui, she started the screening, mandatory screening, and then um, Kamehameha III signs the Quarantine Act, and the fact that our Board of Health was the, is the oldest in the U.S. administratively, it fell under the um, Minister of the Interior. But our Board of Health, like our archives, precede any other in the United States. Okay? So that's something that um, people should remember, is that we were very proactive about taking care of the health of our people. So um, you have these going on in, in 1845 to 49, the California gold miners were bringing influenza in. Um, in 1854, the smallpox from California claimed um, that many lives. And that's when, remember you always hear about government um, doctors, do physicians going around the islands on horseback and they have all these you know, romantic things about them. They actually started out as vaccinate, uh, how do we say this, vaccinators? <laughs> so that was their job. That's in it, yeah. So um, that was, they gradually took over the duties and, uh, and evolved into government physicians. You know, we always hear about government physicians, but that's where they started was um, to go out. And then we have the, um, 1865, the act to prevent the spread of leprosy. So this is the act itself. And then this is a picture that is, you can't see very well, but it's um, one of the first pictures of Queen's Hospital. Um, back then you didn't have nurses there. When you were admitted to the hospital, you came with your own kokua, and that was what they were called. They were called the kokua, and they would live there with you and stay there at the hospital. So um, um, this is, so 65 is the act to prevent leprosy. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. About the 1835, you have to My question yesterday when I visited you was about Koloa Leaving. Okay, so the statement, is there anything else that can read that you would have about the documentation of the leprosy? Because I'm not sure, was there was that a part where the Chinese often came through? We can look that up. I have all my reference all my resources at the end of this. So okay. we can find Because I know about the case of leprosy. Leprosy, yeah, and color. Uh huh. But that he came after eighteen thirty five. Your when your your kupuna were was Oh, okay, okay, that would be, okay. So we could look into that, yeah. Um, um, okay, so that one, and I'll double check to see where that one came from, where that fact came from. Um, so by the 1860s, it's spreading much more. Um, so special facilities for isolation, 
um, by 1865, you have this act that, um, so you have this one in 1865, that's a repeat, but the, it's not till a year later that the first are sent to um, Kalawao at Kalawao Papa. So um, it wasn't until 18, excuse me, 1969 that we ended sending people to Kalawao Papa. So I was, gift, I was um, privileged to, when I was working for the National Park Service, to work on their um, records down there and um, you know, meet some of the patients that are still there. And um, there's been a lot written on that, so I'm not going to cover that there. But I just wanted to show you that Delegate, Wil oops, Delegate Wilcox had a plan, had recommended that we become the place for lepers across the enti entire United States to come to. He felt that, oh, look, we're doing a good job um, handling the lepers here. They're at Kalopapa, and we can continue, to, you know, I don't know what he was thinking. Um, he's talking about removing families, tearing families apart, and all this. But anyway, that was shot down. Um, but that was his recommendation that we become a national, a national station for lepers. Um, and I say lepers, you know, because that's the term that we used at that, in that era. Um, the, another one was in Louisiana. They had another colony over there as well. So um, by eight, 1969, so between 1866, when you see people are sent to 1969, um, over 8,000 people had been sent to Kalapapa. And so when you go and you see the graves, it's just amazing. A friend of mine, just every year she um, has her students, she's a history professor and wrote a very excellent book on um, leprosy, um, Carrie Inglis, and she, um, we love her. <laughs> yeah, I know, we love her. Um, every year they make lace and take it down to Kalapapa for all the um, tombstones. Um, so this is where I think most people are interested uh, came tonight. In 1865 was the first time that you had a law saying that you had to be licensed, okay? How many kahuna would be licensed? Mm -hmm. So this is the beginning of the efforts to... Um, Squash. Yeah, that's a good word. You said it, I said it. <laughs> okay, so your penalty is $100, okay? For each offense, each offense, all right? So, um, your professional qualifications, obtained a certificate of approval from said board, blah, 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 okay? So this is the beginning of it. So while one of the purposes of this law, okay, is to protect the public from persons fraudulently claiming to be kahuna, it, is also, it also set up an obstacle um, for native healers who had to go through this licensing process. And there is no record of the government issuing licenses to kahuna at this time. So it pretty much took care of that. Um, so there was a petition by a JKI of Hamakua um, to practice medicine, which was refused by the Board of Health in 1867. So he tried, you know, he did try. So how do we address this? They say that. Well, in 1868, there was the creation of this Papaola Hawaii. And this for thinking, <laughs> Um, um, petition says that it allows Hawaiian practitioners to um, tra traditional practitioners to practice. So by 1868, Kamehameha V did establish this Hawaiian Board of Health, and it was for those um, very people. So I love, even though I worked at Queens, um, I love this quote. Um, this is by um, one of the um, representatives. Hawaiians were all dying under the influence of foreign medicine. If a man died under a native doctor, the doctor would probably be taken up for murder. No one can deny that natives had died at the Queen's Hospital. Mm -hmm. I thought that was wonderful. So between 1873 and 78, 14 Hawaiians passed the board's test and became licensed to practice traditional medicine. Um, the archives of Hawaii um, on King Street 
has five, they had to take copious notes. They had to say who they saw, what they prescribed, and the results and such. And they have five of those books in the archives of Hawaii. Um, and that licensed kahuna were, were um, mandated to, to keep. So um, just to let you know, though, the, the caliber of some of the people that um, were licensed included a Halimanu of Hamakua, who had several government positions as a private ways and means agent, road supervisor, commissioner of fences, and a member of the House of Representatives. Why, he's busy. Um, <laughs> he's so talented. I feel so, I feel like a real bum. But anyway, um, so what I liked was that Papa Ola Hawaii expanded in 1886 um, to five members appointed by Kalakaua and granted the, this board um, the power to establish local boards on, um, that would report on the qualifications of applicants to practice native medicine and to state if the remedies proposed are suitable cures. Was the board Native Hawaiian? Yes. Yes, so it is reported, now here's the part. Some say, I've read different things, some say, oh, 300 people were licensed as kahuna. Kalakaua was just handing them off left and right. And yet I found some other um, reports that say, no, that was an exaggeration, it really wasn't that many people. Now, I also have to share with you that Kalakaua would write out his own prescriptions. The State Archives has several examples of Kalakaua giving it to his um, guards and saying, here, take this, take that. So um, College of Pharmacy thought that was fabulous. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so that was, was one. Using opium? <laughs> <laughs> None of them I saw for opium. So you have this board. Now you have this strength that they're theoretically licensing 300. So what do you expect the backlash to be? Well, you have all these articles in the paper saying, oh, this, you know, fraudulent, this, this person um, claimed to be a traditional healer and a Hawaiian healer, and this is what happened. So all of these different articles um, um, you know, talking about the evidence and the fine and such. And this is one that I wanted to share with you because this is the kind of stuff that you need. And consider who the editors of these newspapers are too, okay? You got the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, our friend the Thurstons. Um, you've got the Polynesian, you know, so think of that too. But this is one out of the Pacific Commercial Advertiser and it's talking about why I being sentenced for $100 and it says, after dousing, and this is the testimony against um, YVI. After dousing feverishly sickly patient with water inside and out and praying for the better part of the week, patient coughed blood but died. YY appeared in court in a white duster, red vest, white lace and scarf, wide white belt with a silver buckle and cross engraved on his breast. He also carried a large Bible and he still got a hundred bucks. Fine. But this is the kind of um, um, press that they were getting. At the time, I haven't looked in those as well. Um, I'm working with Pokia Nogomaya right now to look at um, some of the, um, and we're, we're trying to go to DC to look at Hawaiian translations, um, Hawaiian papers, Palapala Pala there, because you know in Library of Congress and the National Archives, they're just wasting away in a corner that nobody's looking at. So, because um, my Hawaiian is bad. Okay. <laughs> my kumu was Pua Hopkins, and it's still bad. That's how old I am. <laughs> but, um, but I can find the stuff. <laughs> I can navigate an archives like you can't believe, but I can't read it. Okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so that's why Pua said, okay, you'll be our navigator. We'll be your. <laughs> so, um, so these are some examples. And in one, the. Um, one 1891 article, so you see I have here's 1891, 98, 99, and 1901. All that talent, training, and charity together can do is at hand, free and without price, and yet the death rate of the aboriginal race is to the foreigners as to kahunadum, kahunadum, I love that term, is to be discredited, and then it may die out. It cannot be stamped by force unless it was possible to convict, convict a dozen or more kahunas of manslaughter. 
It is to be feared, however, that the Hawaiian race will die out before its faith in kahunas are seriously disturbed. So that was the kind of um, information, that's the kind of press that they were getting. So you have this going on in the press, and then we're annexed in 1900, and then finally, um, so uh, the Republic, of course, we're not surprised, right? The Republic with um, President Dole um, form repealing the kingdom's laws that established that Hawaiian board for traditional medicine. And then in 1901, this act authorizes Hawaiian kahuna who, um, to practice. So remember what happened in the 1901 territory. You had um, the first time the majority of the legislature was of Hawaiian ancestry. And so you had this act introduced. So what does the Pacific Commercial Advertiser run? This amazing editorial cartoon that has, this is a kahuna, right? And it says, kahuna ana ana. Okay, so that is the kahuna that theoretically can pray you to death because you have kahuna la'au lapa'au, which is the um, plants. You have a kahuna kahea, which is to call out. You have a kahuna. Um, um, so the real kahuna is all of that. Right, right. <laughs> What's that? The divisions of kahunaism became, was that was Americanized. Right. The kahuna of the island were the jacks of all trades. And the knowers of all. The knowers, of, yeah. So and there it, wasn't a there wasn't a kahuna like you're speaking. I mean, I, I, mean, I know what the history is. Right. Whatever that you're speaking on. Uh -huh. But it's not the true history of the Hawaiian Islands and the people. The, the, uh, is that the kahuna knew everything? And that's the thing is that there wasn't a separation. Right. And people think that they when they think kahuna they think medical. <laughs> medical. I mean, what do they call it? What's medicinal. It? Medicinal. <laughs> Whereas you had a kahuna with canoe. Yeah, or building. House, house building. Right. Canoe, yeah, you, everything. You had an, an expert. It was an, an expert. expert. Right. An expert. And they could recite every star in the sky yeah. if they had to. Right. But there's all on a need to go basis. Right. Oh, so the, the kuna is the connection between here and the other side. Right. But so it is, it's being able to connect there at the time we need to. Right. And what the legislators were doing is trying to exactly. do yeah. that so that they could suppress it. Right. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm, you know, I'm, gotcha. yeah. So because I'm not going to go into the knowledge that you're talking about, but rather how the Western legislature responded to this traditional knowledge base. So um, this says that if, um, yeah, so the fact that they selected Ana Ana to put on his briefcase, mm -hmm. what does that tell you right there, mm -hmm. right? The, the worst possible light you can put some, a knowledge base into. And then um, this one, <laughs> this just drives me nuts. Um, he's on the telephone saying, wiki, wiki, get down to the legislature and, and you know, testify. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just, and then this up here says, all the Western doctors will leave. Oh. This is what this is all, showing them getting on the ship, okay? So it is like the most, hideous, insulting cartoon that was run in the Pacific Commercial Advertiser because they went, oh my God, the legislature, which is now Hawaiian controlled, is going to allow the medical practices to, um, to come back. So um, unfortunately, no further action uh, is recorded for this session, possibly due to Solomon, um, the, the, the person from Molokai um, didn't get enough sponsorship. But just the fact that it was introduced into the legislature shows you the type of response that the Western press gave it. So um, this very big um, headline, it, it only talks about one sentence in the article that saying that some of the more ignorant home rulers are talking about kahunanism um, and votes to take the measure through the process of both houses. So this is the type of, um, so how do you do this? How do you respond to this? So in 1905, you had a, the, enacted a requiring license from the board that they were gonna be outlawed and punished by fines or imprisonment, okay? So, but it's still, the knowledge base is there. So the legislature in 1919 kind of works around it 
and they tiptoe and they say, well, let's investigate the purpose, uh, the medicinal properties and values of herbs and plants grown in Hawaii. And then, you know, let's authorize um, permits for a person who um, uses medicines of Hawaiian herbs and plants for medicinal purposes. So this is how they get around it. They don't fo focus on the practice, they just focus on the herbs, the plants and the herbs. And the, the report has been reprinted, you can see it. I think it might be online as well, but it's at the State Archives. You can see this whole 1919 report very easily. Um, and so that's how they try to capture the knowledge and that's how they try to tiptoe around it. But in the meantime, this kind of stuff is still going on in the press. You know, you've got all these, um, oh, here it is. This is a, so this has been reprinted. You can see this, almost every library has this reprint. Um, but this is the kind of information that, and this is um, some of the entries. So, uhi uhi and ule and ulu, you know, all the different uses are in there. So this is um, what's going on at there. So now you have this act in 19, uh, 1919 and you have some of these applicants. So what I want to talk about, um, and you, you know, you have these people, is Mrs. Luca Kinolao. This is a heartbreaking um, story. Mrs. Have you heard of this one? Mrs. Kinolao from Molokai? Okay, she, um, she was reared by her grandparents and knew the names, I mean, excuse me, knew the um, um, uses, and she was renowned in her community um, for her abiling, uh, healing abilities, but could not obtain a medical license. So she went um, to the board, and her, um, in 18, 1948, and she took the test, and even though Kinolao only spoke Hawaiian, there was a translator for her, and one of the three parts of the exam required her to know the Latin names of the Hawaiian plants that she used in medicine. Kinolao failed her examination, receiving a zero for the Latin part of the exam. She appealed the board's decision and challenged the nature of the examination, but the board upheld its decision to deny Kinolao a license. So that's just one of the um, examples of what was going on. Um, in 1865, the Hawaii Medical Board was abolished. I'm sorry, sorry, thank you. I think in the 1800s, um, it was abolished and um, they were no longer recognized through. However, Lomi Lomi was integrated into the massage therapy um, board, of, um, board of massage. And a friend of mine who studied under um, Auntie Margaret Machado, Lomi Lomi, um, did tell me, and she's written a couple books on it, and um, she's an attorney that um, has gone over many of these. She said the full practice of Lomi Lomi is not included in massage. Big surprise. Uh, many Lomi Lomi practitioners do not apply for licensing or failed licensing due to lack of Western concepts and the ter terms of anatomy. So they will either, they will actually choose not to. They say, you know, Lomi Lomi is different from massage. We don't believe in your certification, so they won't even try to do it. Um, so um, it wasn't until 73 that kahuna were legalized again. And because right around here, you've got the Native Hawaiian Health Improvement Act because we, the federal government is going, oh my God, you know, the Hawaiian's health is just so terrible. We've got to do something about it. So now on the federal level, we have the CARE Act, and that allows for additional um, recognition where a funding, just so. so. what I like about it is that a study, what do we do? We make a study, okay? So the study under the grant um, resulted in the Native Hawaiian Health Bill, and then the Improvement Act, creating Papaola Lokahi. And so that established the nine health care centers, and you have the one for Kauai right across the street. Um, so this cr created, um, reauthorized the role of Papa Olo Lokai's role to refocus to training. Okay, so it's not just traditional medicine. They're trying to look at it larger, but the nice thing is that they're, in, they're recognizing 
um, Hawaiian practitioners. And my favorite, Papa Owai, um, he led this. And he said, you know, we're grateful. And there was a lot of going back and forth of that to be on this panel. So they had the healer's law forming a council to decide um, who would be allowed to practice Native Hawaiian healing and how that licensing will be. So they took it down to grassroots. That's the nice thing about it. Um, so they created this um, quantum that said you have to be um, a so much percentage of Hawaiian blood and it went back and forth. So um, he was saying it's, you know, the blood quantum licensure certificate raised in the legislation are inappropriate to, and culturally unacceptable for government to ascertain. It's up to us. It's our kuleana, okay? So don't tell us how to determine who's going to be recognized by us. So um, they created up Papa Owai, Isapo Okela, the head, Agnes Cope, Malia Craver, um, Kalua, um, Kaihua, and Auntie Margaret Machado. And so they created the Kahuna Statement in 1998. And then based on that, um, there was this act. So this goes on, and what is, this says is that the, each council is independent of state government, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And then um, there are certain amendments to this, and that's when they went back and forth. Um, and I wanted to tell you about this one. Um, okay, so Act 162 uh, exempted Native Hawaiian practitioners from state licensure. Licensure, sure. Can I say that? Um, for practicing medicine for two years. So it went back and forth. They were they were trying to do these. Um, oops. They were trying to do these um, holding patterns and such. Um, Today, the healer's law puts certification in the hands of traditional Hawaiian healing community. So there are several councils across the state, and they are able to determine by their own criteria for certification. Um, so that went um, back and forth. And then here's the Kapuna statement. And what I wanted to tell you about that is that Act 304, there it is, enables Papa Ola Lokahi to form a panel or panels to be convened and exempts practitioners from liability under medical licensing law. So they changed the panel, you know, they changed the word from panel to council, that's fine. Um, then in 2005, amendments included, this is what I wanted to get into, eliminated the requirement that three members of the certification panels have Native Hawaiian ancestry. It created more autonomy, creating guidelines, distinguishing them from government entities. Hawaiian ancestry, though, was reinstated in 2009. So you can see how they're, they're still struggling with it. Um, the, and this is directly from the Babette Glang, who's in charge of the traditional healing complementary health director of the Papa Ola Lokahi, is that we don't, we just recognize, we don't certify. That's what she wanted to make the point, in that um, of all the five Native Hawaiian healthcare systems statewide have recognized the Kapuna Councils working on how to incorporate traditional healing services to the clients of their system, while at the same time maintaining cultural integrity of these practices. They, not Papa Ola Lokahi, make decisions for their systems, for their islands, for their communities. So um, that's something that's what I like a lot, that um, they're leaving it there. Most recently, uh, this was in 2013, that um, this study was made on the regulation of herbal therapies. And that's another way that the government is just trying to check on it, but not get involved. But check on it, but not get involved. And um, their recommendation was, don't touch it. It's doing fine. We're not going to get involved. Um, so according to Babette Galang again, she said, please keep in mind that the state auditor's report based on information in reports 
or his interpretations and understandings of what is shared with him via various interviews with certain practitioners. You cannot westernize a traditional practice or try to place it in Western context. Despite all the laws attempting to control Native Hawaiian traditional health practices, Papa Ola Lokahi supports the Kahuna statement. So that's where it stands right now. You have it at the grassroots level in different councils on the island. And um, I just wanted to let you know, right now the only um, care provider that recognizes traditional practice is Aloha Care. So not HMSA, not Kaiser, but Aloha Care will recognize it. And a friend of mine um, works there and I said, really, what made you so enlightened? And I didn't respond to that one. But, um, <laughs> but I think he thought I was being flippant. So this is um, where it stands right now. Um, it's at the, this is some of the references that I'll share with you, Liberta, so that we can check on your koloa. And um, this is, I think what, if you wanna see more involvement here, it's Ho'ola, Lahui, Hawaii, and um, I see that Sean Chun is recognized as a practitioner here. Um, I noticed that he doesn't call himself a kahuna, but rather a la'au, lapa'au practitioner, which I thought was very nice because I've known people on other islands that make a big splash about kahuna. And um, exactly, you never see, you will never run and put it on your license plate. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> I mean, this man, I, I, I was just like, oh, ouch. You know? you know, I had the honor of working with Papa Owai and I'm from Heiia, where Lono was practiced in the 70s. And if you're a kahuna, you don't go around right. saying it like that. So Kauai. you don't go around advertising. Yeah, that. right. Yeah. You don't go and, and the very thing you said around um, when America col uh, colonized or mm -hmm. annexed the islands, the Hawaiians started dying from their medicines and so on because. It's not who we are, it's not where we come from. Papa Wai passed the same way. Yep. In the hospital. Yep. All yeah. the time in his life. The only yep. time you're given yep. American medicine. That's when he died. And he, yep. and he couldn't say no because he couldn't tell he was unconscious at the yeah. time. Yeah. His sister's moaning for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I met him oh, years ago. So, that's where it's at right now. And I thank you for your attention. I have a few comments about epilepsy uh -huh. that has impacted my life. Uh -huh. um, I'm a well-known genealogist. Actually, my strength is Hawaiian genealogy. <coughs> and when I was doing my genealogy, um, I stumbled about among the news articles about leprosy in Kalalao. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know Ko'olau is very famous. Mm -hmm. So what struck me is that um, how widespread it was. So one day, I, I was at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, trustee meeting, and Judge Mossman, who was a trustee, before the meeting started, and he said, Liberta, can you help me find my tutu? I can't seem to find her. So he wrote his genealogy on this piece of paper, and I proceeded to find her. Mm -hmm. What was so shocking is that her name was Kalaau Puhi Puhi, born in Niihau, and when I found the records, she went to Kalapapa. Mm -hmm. So I found some of the documents in the Kauai Historical Society. This is a very good you know, to go to the historical society. They have a lot of information there. So I printed the documents out and I sent it to her. Then she was forever touched, not knowing what happened to her. So, you know, the Kauai Historical Society is very important. I've gotten a lot of good information and that's why I'm a 30-year member they all going there. In fact, I just walked out to see Helen yesterday. And mahalo, because you know, a lot of people don't realize that you know 
often people come in and they go, can you help us? Oh, thank you for your service. And like, we're not the library. We don't get government funding. We don't get, you know, we are. And another comment, you know, there's volunteers that scan the pictures. Mm -hmm. They've been doing it for years. So I had them on the computer looking for my kupuna, you couldn't find anything. These are the volunteers that go for years to the historical society. So I want to thank you for being such good volunteers. I wish I could give more <laughs> of my time on this. Mahalo. <laughs> um, I wrote um, a couple of articles for, that were in the um, Hawaii Journal of Medicine. Um, and it focuses more on the, um, the laws of the kuna, so on, on um, how they addressed and treated the kuna. Mm -hmm. So I have copies of this available for you as well. I mean, this is available online, but I just figured, why not give it to you? Um, so this will have very scholarly, okay? <laughs> so it has in AMA reference style, all the references, and um, so that's available to all of you as well. So, and it's called Transition from Traditional to Western Medicine in Hawaii, and it's in two parts. It was um, two different issues. And um, so that gives you um, a little more focus on that. Okay, okay. mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have an announcement that if you go on the restroom, there's no lights. <laughs> so if you've got a cell phone with a light on it, you can probably use the restroom. <laughs> they are open for a while. And so uh, thank you again, Helen. Uh, interesting talk. And uh, thank you again all for coming. Uh, hope to see you again.